It's like we're living in an H.G. Wells novel. There's a pandemic outside. Millions are dying. And then, upon the ashes of the old civilization, a new world state is built. That was H.G. Wells' dream. So, um, I'm going to do a little talk here on the life of H.G. Wells. Wells is principally known to be the father of science fiction. And we can tell by the amount of movies that have been made and radio plays and articles and books about Wells that he had a large impact on modern culture. In fact, let's just see how many film adaptations. Time Machine, three film adaptations, and two television versions. The Island of Dr. Moreau, three film adaptations. Invisible Man, must be very popular. Six film adaptations. And War of the Worlds, seven movies. And of course, the very, very famous radio drama done in 1938 by Orson Welles, which caused a panic throughout the whole United States. So, everybody knows about H.G. Wells, kind of, but not really. You know him through the movies that you've seen, but you don't really know the person that lived from 1866 to 1946. And it's a very, very interesting life and a very interesting person. So here's a picture of Wells around in his 60s, in the 1930s. By this time, Wells was uh, one of the most influential writers of English in the world. And at this time, he wasn't really known so much for science fiction, but more almost as a journalist and as a writer who went around the world interviewing uh, personages like uh, uh, President Roosevelt, Stalin, all in an effort to bring the, uh, his concept of the world state closer together. This Wells, the one we have in the picture here, wrote his autobiography, which has a very, very interesting title, Experiment in Autobiography, Discoveries and Conclusions of a Very Ordinary Brain Since 1866. As you get to know Wells a little bit, you'll understand the point of view of this title. He considered himself and his life and his thoughts to be experimental in quality meaning that there was no assumptions here in terms of how to live, how to think. And as we shall see, all his work came from that premise. This is 1934, he wrote this particular book. But the wells that I'm kind of interested in and the one I'm gonna be talking about is the wells that was a late Victorian. He was born in 1866 and most of the work that he's known for in terms of the science fiction is, was actually written in a very short period of time between 1894 and 1900. Time Machine, Visible Man, Island of Dr. Moreau, and War of the Worlds was all done by the year 1900. And the year 1900 has a very, very special significance in a couple of different fashions. One, Ah, well, I'll get to that in a second. But one reason for the importance of the year 1900 is at that time, um, Wells came upon his concept of the world state. And it was from that time on, from the year 1900, he uh, began uh, politicizing and writing about the need and the necessity for that. The other reason the year 1900 is very, very important um, is that by the year 1900, the modern state as we know it, which its definitions has been pretty much formed. This is the idea that uh, Robert Marx has in his book, which I really, uh, really uh, encourage the reader to get and to read. Origins of the Modern World, and notice the subtitle, A Global Environmental Narrative, from the 15th to the 21st century. 
And Marx in his last chapter, which is called The Great Departure, in the first sentence, basically says exactly that. That by 1900, the major elements of the modern world had been created. And I thought it was a nice coupling here. Wells says, in 1900, I had already grasped the inevitability of the world state. The Wells that I introduced, uh, that you saw a picture of previously, the one in the 1930s, uh, I want to introduce you to two quotes that he, he said. Um, the first one was done in a 1941 edition of a book called The War in the Air. He wrote the first edition in 1909. It was reprinted again around 1920-something, around 1930. Uh, and then, uh, one more time in 1941, he was asked to write a preface for it. And after looking at the preface of the second edition, he had nothing to add except, except, I told you so, you damn fools. And, uh, basically said, nothing except my epitaph, that when the time comes, it will manifestly, manifestly have to be, I told you so, you damn fools. And the reason he said that was that from the period from 1900 on, he saw catastrophe coming, and at least he thought he had the solution for it. And when it came, it was no surprise to him. The second quotation, I think, of interest here is this one. Human history becomes more and more a race between education and catastrophe. And Wells wrote this in the Outline of History in 1920. And I think, uh, especially during this time uh, in the p pandemic that we're experiencing, that this concept of education and catastrophe is pretty obvious in the sense that we, in order to uh, for humanity to uh, avoid extinction, we have to know and learn a lot better about what our circumstances actually are. So the next chart here is basically a, a biographical profile of Wells. And notice I have the time period before he's born. He's born in 1866, and I have an event after his death, which is in 1946. The, the reason I did that was I was trying to contextualize his life so you get a real sense of um, where he was placed in terms of events. And if you notice very e quickly that born, you know, being born in 1866, he saw an amazing amount of major historical events and you might call them catastrophes, including World War I, the Depression, the, uh, the Second World War, the Russian Revolution, and most interestingly, the atomic bomb drop in 1945. So a lot of people uh, know Wells as a seer of the future, but it's good to note at this point that Wells wrote a book in 1912 called The World Set Free. And the main ingredient in that book was atomic bombs. So they weren't exactly the same as the ones that were eventually set off, but the but he did have them in that particular book. Okay. So I I've, I've called this discourse that I'm that I'm organizing here as HG Wells an existential crisis. So most of us don't think on a day-to-day -day basis usually about existential crisis. We are right now, because when your life is threatened, when your existence is threatened, that by definition is existential crisis. And most of us don't realize that on a day-to-day -day basis, the whole world has been living in terms of existential crisis since 1945. So existentialism as in and of itself was a literary and philosophical movement around right after the Second World War. And the, the way I'm going to approach it without, so I don't get too complicated, is that existentialism has a dual aspect. One I call personal and the other collective. The personal aspect is a crisis of values. In a sense, what is the meaning of life? And how do I live? 
this particular cover of Time in 1956. It's one of the probably the most famous cover of Time magazine. And of course, the the cover here that what's being communicated is not necessarily the God's death, but the crisis of values that modern civilization was going through in the 1950s. So I call this the personal aspect in terms of existential crisis. The collective aspect of existential crisis was, of course, the atomic bomb exploding in 1945 and the Cold War that came afterwards. That heralded a period where at any moment, any time, civilizations could disappear in a flash, a literal flash, an atomic flash. So, so this is where, fortunately or unfortunately, I don't know exactly what Wells said, because he died in 1946. I can only imagine that he, the level of pessimism he must have felt in 1945 when he heard that the, the bomb had been exploded. At the end of his life, he was extremely pessimistic and wrote one of the darkest books, some call it the darkest book in the English language, called Mind at the End of Its Tether. And I'm not going to talk about that book very much, but it's certainly the pronouncements of somebody who does not have much hope for the human race. But I'm not going to, uh, like I say, talk about that right now. But where I am turning to right now is the 19th century, the period before Wells was born. And this crisis of values, existentialism, and this crisis of civilization in the collective sense already has its beginnings in the 19th century. Two of the thinkers that are usually connected to that crisis uh, is Kierkegaard and Dostoevsky. And Kierkegaard, as you can see the dates, 1813 to 1855, wrote a book called The Sickness Unto Death. Dostoevsky notes in the underground crime and punishment. And the very famous pronouncement of Dostoevsky, which is, if God is dead, then everything is permitted. And in other words, how do we live? And what's the basis of our moral and ethical life? Now, I'm gonna go back even further in time to the 18th century, when we have the group of folks called the Philosophs. And it's hard to imagine now that the concept of progress, it's so much a part of our lexicon in, in terms of our contemporary life, it's hard to imagine that at one time there was no concept as such. In the 18th century, there was a guy named Condorcet and there's his dates right there, 1743, 1794. And basically, he argued that expanding knowledge in the natural world and social sciences would lead to an ever more just world of individual freedom, material affluence, and moral compassion. So the idea of progress comes at a time when rationalism is coming to the fore. And more, more than just that, the Industrial Revolution, which is usually given the date around 1750, is beginning to occur. So when Wells is born in 1866, the Scientific Revolution, or I should say the, the Industrial Revolution, um, is in full, full swing. Uh, one of the main ingredients of the Industrial Revolution around 1850 is trains. There was absolutely almost no trains in 1800. And by the time 1850, there's tens of thousands of miles of trains. And there was uh, an optimism that's usually associated with the Victorian period in that things are going to get better and better and life is going to get better and better. And of course, England would be leading the show because it was at that time the most industrialized country in the world. In 1851, it was what was called the Great Exhibition of the World's, the Works of the of Industry of All Nations, which took place in, in England, and that was a showcase of England and all the industrialized countries of the world of, of their manufacturing and industrial skills. And this was, in a sense, a statement of the potential for progress in 
the contemporary civilization of the 19th century. Of course, at this time, unbeknownst to the ordinary folks that were attending this great exhibition, there were six million people that attended, there were cracks already forming in the intellectual underpinnings uh, of this optimism. And it all came from science. It's interesting when you go back and think about the scientific revolution that began with Copernicus, it was paradigm shifting, as they say. But the fact of the matter is, after Copernicus said that, guess what? The sun doesn't revolve around us, we revolve around the sun. Most people could simply go back to how they lived previously without, a, without much ado. After all, what did that change on a daily basis of folks of their customary life? And as science and mathematics progressed, there wasn't all that much threat to the way people, humans conceived of themselves. But in this century, starting with discoveries in geology, physics, and most importantly, biology, there was an enormous threat, and there still is, in terms of are humans in the center of the universe? And Unfortunately, as we've gone further on and on, there's a very nice lecture by Carl Sagan about this, human beings are getting more and more demoted <clears throat> in terms of importance. So these three discoveries, or three uh, uh, steps, first of all in geology, the concept of deep time, deep time with the publication of the Principles of Geology by Sir Charles Lyell, around 1830, basically shifted the whole concept of time. By this time, of course, not too many people did believe that the Earth was 6,000 years old, <clears throat> but the geologists firmed all that up in terms of showing that the strata in, in, in the rocks, uh, in the Earth, showed uh, an unbelievably longer period of time. The second thing was physics. In 1850, Rudolf Clausius and William Thomson stated the second law of thermodynamics, which is called the law of entropy. Energy is in a constant state of dissipation. In other words, everything is on a, in a sense, downward slope. Energy is constantly being lost. Not an optimistic way of looking at life. And third, the most importantly, is biology, the theory of evolution with the publication of The Origin of the Species in 1859 by Sir Charles Darwin. It's this last item, the theory of evolution, which really rocked Western civilization. Because the fundamental question that confronted was, what is the difference between humans and animals, and where do we come from? While Darwin wasn't trying to engage first principles, in other words, did God create us or not, he was engaging in everything that came after that. And this shock um, is something that human beings could not ignore anymore. And in fact, we still see this to present day, where people are still do not believe in evolution, though it's a mainstay in terms of science. Um, people still do not believe in evolution and we can say that a lot of the science deniers come from people who are uh, believers in terms of traditional religion and have a great difficulty in accepting Darwinian evolution. Now, to think that Wells escaped from these crises would be completely a mistake. In fact, he went through the same crisis himself. He was born to a very, uh, in terms of class, low social class family. His mom was basically a servant at the estate of uh, nobility. And Wells had to really struggle 
in order to bring himself up to his full potential. His, his mom's great hope for him was that he would be a draper's assistant, something that uh, one day fell simply because he walked, I forgot how many miles, 20 or 30 miles, told her that if she didn't uh, stop, he would just commit suicide in terms of, um, in terms of his life choices. So, the, the main, the main uh, way that, of Wells's, the main way that Wells positioned himself is, is really, really interesting um, in terms of how, what his relationship was to the society around him. Given the fact that he was, quote, a scientist, but he was also an artist as well. He was a writer. And his position in relation to the society is very, very fascinating. So I'm um, trending back towards existentialism again here. This is a book by Colin Wilson, which is really a fascinating book. This book was written in 1956. It's actually called the, the Year of the Angry Young Men. And Colin Wilson, among other writers, um, came out with this book. Before I tell you a little bit about the book, I want to tell you a little bit more about Colin Wilson, who high school dropout, who decided to study all by himself. I guess you might say he was self-schooled or homeschooled, and he spent his days at the, uh, at the British Public Library reading and taking notes. And then he was about a little over 20 years old at the time in 1956, when he published this book about called The Outsider. And The Outsider is a study of outsiders, starting from the 19th century all the way through the 20th century. And he was quite shocked when the book came out, he was suddenly famous. And T.S. Eliot, by the way, told him that it was very unfortunate for him because it, it, instant success is sometimes the worst thing that can happen to a creative artist. But in this book, Wilson, in the first two chapters, actually um, discusses Wells quite a bit. And the first chapter is actually named after a, sh a short story that Wells wrote, which I'm going to talk about, which is called In the Country of the Blind. And the second chapter as well, is called World Without Values. And in both of these chapters, Wells takes a prominent place in terms of Colin Wilson's discussion. And there it is, Country of the Blind and World Without Values. So this is a great book and tells, uh, tells us a lot about Wells' state of mind as he was emerging out of his own uh, past so to speak, in terms of his family, and beginning to take his appropriate place, which was around 1890s. I'm going to talk about this short story by H.G. Wells called The Country of the Blind. The, the plot is about uh, someone named Nunez. And one day Nunez, he takes a hike over the mountains in Peru, and he gets lost, and he actually accidentally um, runs into the legendary country of the blind, and just like it sounds, everybody there is blind, and Nunez thinks, well, he's going to have a superior position here, I have sight, they're blind, and I will, of course, be dominant which is not the case at all. When he meets the people of the country of the blind, they think something is completely wrong with him. And rather than sight being an advantage, their prescription is to potentially take his eyes out, particularly after he wants to marry one of their own. And so the only solution, they say, if he wants to marry this one woman is for him to have his eyes taken out. And so 
this is obviously an allegory about seeing and the idea that if a human being sees something in reality that others don't see, the first thing that they want to do is eliminate or disregard, you know, that particular person. You could see the same kind of theme, for example, in uh, Ibsen's uh, uh, Enemy of the People. When you become the exception, you become a target. So at the end of the story, Nunez is trying to figure out, should he get his eyes taken out or shouldn't he? And one night he escapes. It does, there is no ending. He basically, he's up in the mountains and presumably he dies. But in 1939, um, Wells went and decided to put another ending on the story. So he wrote, first wrote the story in 1904. And then in 1939, he decides, well, I'm going to put a new ending on the story where Nunez doesn't die in the middle of the night on a cold mountain. Instead, in the original story, Nunez climbs high into the surrounding mountains until night falls, until he rests, weak with cuts and bruises, but happy that he has escaped the valley. His fate is not revealed. In the revised and expanded 1939 edition of, version of the story, Nunez sees from a distance that there is about to be a rock slide. He attempts to warn the villagers, but again, they scoff at his imagined sight. He flees the valley during the slide, taking Medina Sarote with him. So this problem, this problem of seeing, the visionary trying to warn um, his compatriots that there's a danger and that they need to listen to him and respond to that danger is a major theme in Wells' literature. And here I have, I wanted to show the antecedent, you know, for Wells' idea, which is Plato's allegory of the cave. Some of you may be familiar with it. Plato's allegory is about three men, I believe three, who are tied together in a cave, and all they can see is the shadows of people moving about and objects moving about so that they never really see what is actually going on. One of the men escapes, sees the world for what it is, comes back and informs them of what they, what's out there. And they of course think he's lying and they threaten to kill him if he persists. So this is Plato's allegory of the cave, and you can see it's, this allegory is about truth and about people who seek truth, despite no matter what other people say around them. And so I really wanted to point that particular out. Now, the period of time that I want to discuss about Wells' writings are in the 1890s. And what I wanted to show here was that this was not the only writing that he was doing. He was very, very busy trying to understand the problems of the particular generation or period of time that he was, that he was living in. And the 1890s in particular had the sense of doom since it's a lot like the end of our uh, 1900s coming to the millennium. There was what they call the fin de siècle, the end of the century. And there was a lot of negativity or pessimism about the future. And it was during this time that Wells was writing, again, Time Machine, Island of Dr. Moreau, Invisible Man, and War of the Worlds. But at the same time, he was also writing other articles which you might call philosophical or speculative in nature, such as the rediscovery of the uh, unique, the limits of human plasticity, human evolution and artificial process, morals and civilization. So I'm pointing this out to show you that 
the books that he was writing were thought experiments about some of the issues that were stimulated mostly from Darwinian theory. And that the, the books and the thinking process, these articles go together and that they can be used to help us understand and elucidate what, what he was thinking about. Again, after about 1900 or so, he really did not write that much science fiction at all. His books after that were, uh, he wrote a book called The Modern Utopia, he wrote The Outline of History, he wrote all these other books, he wrote more than 40 novels. Very few after 1900 were, were just science fiction. One of the reasons that we need to listen to what he says is, first of all, I believe that the period we're living in is originated in the same period that he was living in. And the second thing is that as an artist, um, artists are what you might think of as the early warning system, a do line for future issues. And Wells, even though it's oh, a hundred, over a hundred years ago now, still I think there's a great deal in there for us to understand and learn that's appropriate for our, our period of time that we're living in. Uh, I do like this quote from Marshall McLuhan, Understanding Media. I think of art as its most significant, as a do line, a distant early warning system that can always be relied on to tell the old culture what is beginning to happen to it. The power of the arts to anticipate future social and technological developments by a generation or more has long been recognized in this century. As Rapin called the artist, the antennae of the race. And so Wells is living in a period of enormous transition and we're living in still that uh, developments that, are, that were occurring at that time. And so I think Wells has a great profitability for us to look at. Lastly, I uh, wanted to end off with this particular quote because it gives the sense of limits on our life, whatever it is, 70, 80 years, and yet our attempts to connect ourselves with something much larger that's gone on for eons and eternity. And it's a quote by James Joyce. Welcome, O life, I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my, of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. All right. So this is the first lecture. The second, the next lecture, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, the time machine, 1895. And um, let me see if I have it here. Yeah, I have. this is the edition that I'm going to be using if you want to follow along. Um, and then I'm going to successively go to Island of Dr. Moreau, The Invisible Man and War of the Worlds in four successive lectures. All right, thank you.